Hey, welcome to this week's study guide. We continue in our series through the book of Ephesians. We are walking it out, how to live out the theology, how to live out what God does through salvation in our lives, how to live out being filled with the Spirit. Last week we talked about don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And immediately Paul goes into what that looks like, and he says, when we live in submission to the Spirit, we also live in submission to one another. Because logically, if we're filled with the Spirit, we should be submitted to one another, which is a cool idea. So today we're talking about the family and how we walk it out as family. And so we jump right into the scripture and we start in Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Right away, we're into our first and second questions based on just this verse. Question number one, what is the biblical definition of submit? And how is it different than our modern concept? Well, submission biblically is the willingness to lay down. It's not being put down. It is the willingness to lay down our rights and our privileges to honor others and to to come after and follow others as they lead and guide us. And so this is a mutual submission that we that we love one another, we submit to one another, we respect one another's opinions, ideas, and advice. And that is exactly what happens when again we are filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's not something that we are being we are being made to be submissive. It's something where we willingly and and honorably and and is that a word honorably <laughs> and 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 um, we lay down our rights so that we might be able to get along with one another. Very important. Now that leads us to a second question: What enables us to mutually submit? Well, I hope that you saw, and I kind of gave you some hints on it earlier. We are enabled to mutually submit by the Holy Spirit being in us. You see, in the Godhead, there's equality. And we see that Jesus did not did not think that there was any problem being considered to be equal with the Father. Nonetheless, he submitted himself to the Father's will. We see that God's Holy Spirit, again, equal with Christ, equal with the Father, is willing to do what Christ leads and guides him to do. And so we see that just as in the Godhead, we being filled with the Spirit mutually submit to one another. It's the filling of the Spirit that makes us able to do that, which is really cool. Now we move on and we go into verse 22. And so, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Well, this can be a problematic, troubling verse, but it really should not be when we really understand and grasp what this means. And so here we go. Question number three, based upon these verses, in the Godhead, there is equality and order. How should or how does the home reflect the Godhead? Well, as we were talking about earlier again, when we reflect the Godhead, there's equality. There is nobody usurping or undermining anybody else's importance or power, but there is order. When we have order in our home, then we reflect the Godhead. And that leads us to question number four. Again, based upon the same verses, what does, quote, wives submit to your husbands not look like? And what does it look like? Well, let's just be very clear, very right up front. Wife submitting to the husband does not mean the husband is the boss. It doesn't mean that he's passing her around like she's a child. It doesn't mean that his way or the highway. It doesn't mean that she's second rate. It doesn't mean that he is elevated above her. All those things are in stark contrast to the biblical understanding of submission and basically to the picture of the Godhead. And so what does it look like? A wife willingly follows her husband's lead. He listens to her advice. He accepts her instruction. He, he heeds her warnings. At the same time, in the end, she will come under his protection and care, knowing that he has to answer to God for that particular role. I know this sounds very difficult, but wait, ladies, wait and listen to what the guys have to do. And as a matter of fact, let's get on to that in verse 25. 
5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And so, what a mouthful that is. Here's question number five. How did Christ love the church? And what must a husband do to accomplish this kind of love for his wife? Now, this is huge. Men, when you are placed in a position of authority, it's really less authority. It's more responsibility. You see, Jesus loved the church so much so that he suffered a tormenting death on the cross. He agonized through beatings and through punching and plucking out of the beard and crowns of thorns. This is what he did for the good of the church. It wasn't something where he was bossing everybody around. It was something where he laid down his life. And so that leads us to the second part of the question. What does it look like, men, to love your wives that way? Well, we're to do everything we can to love them, to protect them, to defend them, to build them up. In this passage, it says, so that he might present her to himself a glorious bride. We're responsible to help our wives come to know Christ in a deeper and fuller way. We are to feed them and to nourish them and to help them to grow so that they might be glorious. It is it is not a position of authority and privilege. It's a position of tremendous responsibility. And so based upon that, let me ask you one more question here. How is this different than the Greek, Roman, and Jewish cultures of the day? This is quite different than the cultures of the day. It's quite different than our culture this day. How is it different? Well, we remind ourselves what the Greek, Roman, and Jewish cultures of the day look like. Women had no power, no authority. They were nothing more than animals in the eyes of the law. And we see here, this is earth-shattering, ground-shaking. Husbands, love your wives and lay down your lives for them. Wow. What an elevation of womanhood we see in this passage. And the home is to reflect the Godhead, to reflect the love of Christ. Now, I told you one more question earlier. Actually, I have a few more. Here's number seven. Who has the harder job, a husband or a wife? In this passage, who has the harder job with the most responsibility? Well, I'm sure that that was an interesting conversation. We see here, I believe the harder job is for the man because he is to lay down his life. You see, the church responded to Christ. Now, it's not always easy being the church. And throughout the history, the church has suffered for Christ. But nothing compared to the suffering that Christ gave for the church. That's that's a tough position to be in. And so, men, again, it's not a position of privilege, but a position of responsibility. Ladies, you find yourself safer when you come under the care and the protection of your husband. And I hope that he will be worthy of that. Verse 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. And so, based upon that, question number 8, Where does submission to God begin? And are you teaching your kids and your grandkids? Well, obviously, we submit to God when we first submit to our parents. We don't learn how to submit to God until we learn how to submit to our parents. We reflect the Godhead when we honor our parents. And that leads us to a fourth, one one more verse, verse 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And so there we go. In this verse, there's a great picture of what discipline ought to be. How might it be different than what you thought. How might it be different than what you thought? Well, there we have it. Disciplining kids isn't punishing them, it's training them and teaching them, and especially in the knowledge of the Lord. 
children are drawn to a mom and dad that love the Lord and honor the Lord by honoring and submitting to one another. And children learn how to submit to God when we teach them how to submit to parents who love them and are willing to lay down their life. Don't exasperate your kids. Love them, train them, correct them when needed, but lead them to understand the love of God as they see it reflected in mom and dad. I hope that you've enjoyed this time this week, and I pray that your family would be a way that you walk out your faith in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.